turn your Bible to Acts chapter 18. How's everybody doing? Nice to see all of you. And for you mothers, happy Mother's Day. <clears throat> awesome day to be a mother. Um, it's been funny because I... I've been talking, you know, saying Happy Mother's Day to mothers all morning, and a lot of them have said, oh, Happy Mother's Day to you. Oh, I mean, I was like, it's not the first time I've been called a mother, you know. <laughs> Happened a few times, especially when I was younger. <coughs> <I'm> sorry. <coughs> we need to pray. Uh, oh. <coughs> so... Fearless is the title of our sermon, and I think fearfulness is a common thing. It's part of the human condition, isn't it? It's part of who we are. We get afraid of things, and, and it can range. I mean, from just a minor fear like, you know, failed hopes, like things you hope it was going to happen, you're afraid it's not going to happen in your life, <clears throat> that type of fear, um, maybe a fear that you have, just an anxiety about if you're a mother with small children going into you know, into the grocery store with your children, your fear of embarrassment, you know, which is probably going to happen. <clears throat> well, one time, Shannon and I were in Walmart. This was birth control for us for a few years. Um, we saw this mom. I kid you not, she was dragging a child. on. She had a leash on the kid, and he was kicking and screaming, and she was just dragging him across the floor, and she was just saying, I said no. I said no. And he's just, ah! And, and I, I looked at Shannon, and I said, it can never come to that can never happen <laughs> to us, you know. But fear can take on more serious forms, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> more serious forms. Um, perhaps fear of losing your job, not being able to provide for your family, or, or maybe that sheer terror that you feel in the middle of the night, you're, woke, you're woken up suddenly, and somebody's in the house that's not supposed to be in the house. You know, that grips you. You know, it's a terrifying fear. And yet, <clears throat> in the Bible, we're told, as I mentioned last week, 365 times not to fear. Don't fear. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said something similar when he said, don't fear those who can destroy the body, right? But fear him, fear God, who can cast both soul and body into hell. And so <clears throat> fear is not to be something that we have, especially um, when it comes to life circumstances as Christians. Literally, you should live a life, Christian, free from fear. You should be fearless. And yet I don't think that that's always the reality for a lot of us all the time. <clears throat> now I've had this scenario, <coughs> excuse me, I had a scenario play out in my life so many times from terror. <coughs> Sorry. I did really good last service. <coughs> Allergies still. But terror, fear, impossible circumstances. You know, just kind of wondering how things are going to turn out. And yet every time I have taken those circumstances and given them to the Lord, He removes fear. He makes fear things so much better, you know, in our lives. He, he is sufficient. A few years back, Shad and I were faced with a pretty big challenge, and, and the challenge just kind of came on us unexpectedly to where we needed a lot of money really fast. It was basically, you know, you have a week to come up with thousands of dollars. Now, I don't know if any of you just have the ability to come up with thousands of dollars, but at, at that time, we had no ability to do that. And, you know, it, it was like stark reality hit us and we just took that and just laid it before the Lord. So Lord, you know what's going on here. <clears throat> you need to help us. We have no way. We, we weren't even in the mode of, oh, what can we sell? Because we just really didn't have anything to sell even at that point. And we're just, just laying it before the Lord. And, you know, reading George Mueller and Hudson Taylor, we just knew this isn't something we need to tell anybody about. We're just going to pray and let the Lord handle it. That was kind of what we decided. And we prayed, and I kid you not, a miracle took place. It was, it was beyond what you could even imagine. At that moment that we prayed, God just put a peace on us. 
We just had a, a complete peace, no anxiety, and, and just it kind of sustained us. And as the week went on, um, <clears throat> the due date's coming, and, and then all of a sudden, I'm not sure where it came from or how it got there or if it was an angel or if it was a person or how the money showed up, but it just showed up unexpectedly, and I have no idea where it came from. just showed up all the money. And yet when it came, you know, it was surprising, but it wasn't too surprising because that peace sustained us through the whole thing, and we were able to pay the bill, no problem. And yet I would argue that the greater miracle was not the money showing up. The greater miracle was the peace that we had before any money showed up, before there was even a promise or an inkling that any money was going to show up. But God sustained us, and he gave us just an amazing peace through that circumstance. And so too with Paul. <clears throat> As we see Paul um, on his th- second missionary journey, he's, he's traveled through so many places, so many trials, so many things, and he was going through a serious bout with fear. And, and God, in his way, would, would show him that, that he is sufficient. He's sufficient. <clears throat> and, and, and the Lord would appear to Paul. And, and basically comfort him. And I think, you know, when you think about, <coughs> when you think about Paul, there's a reality to Paul and, and his life and all the things that he went through as he was traveling from church to church and visiting people and ministering to people and going through trials and going through victories, that his theology, his relationship with God was being developed. And, and no doubt, as we read the epistles, as we read Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians and all these letters that he wrote to these churches, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Thessalonians, that he was putting on, on paper his relationship with the Lord, what he had learned as he walked with the Lord. And so when we find, like we talked about last week and, and we're going to look at again this week, that promise there in, in Philippians chapter 4, and remember, we always remember where it's at because when you're in a fix... Philippians 4, 6, right? Yeah. When you're in a fix, Philippians 4, 6 and 7, right? Which says, be anxious for nothing. Now, Paul had to learn this, right? He hadn't learned it at this point. But he would learn that soon. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And here's the promise. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. It was probably this circumstance that we're looking at today that birthed that verse in Paul's life. And so too, as you go through trial, as you go through temptation, the Lord can use the same promise, the same thing to be true in your life. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 18. Let's back up to verse 9. It says, Now... The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silence. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, um, Galileo, um, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if this is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be a judge of such matter. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila <clears throat> were with him, and he had his hair cut in Centria, for he had taken a vow. And he, he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay longer, a longer time with them, he did not consent. But he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return to you, return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia, 
in order, strengthening all the disciples. <coughs> so, you remember that this is Paul <coughs> concluding his second missionary journey. So far on this journey, he left again from Antioch to, to start this journey, going up to Galatia and Phrygia, those areas. And, and then their plan was to go to Asia, to go to Asia and preach the gospel in Ephesus and, and Philadelphia and Thyatira and all those cities there. But the Holy Spirit said no. And so they tried to go to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit said no. And so they ended up in Macedonia after a vision. And in Philippi of Macedonia, remember that Paul was there preaching the gospel to these ladies. They got saved. Then there was a demon-possessed girl. They got, ended up casting the demon out and getting thrown in jail. Just crazy circumstances, beaten, thrown in jail. Finally, they were let out. They went down to, Th- to Thessalonica. The Jews got really angry with them. Paul had a flea town in the middle of the night, went to Berea. The Jews actually searched the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. And, you know, a lot of people believed in Berea, but then the Thessalonians found out he was there, and they went down and attacked them. And Paul had to flee again, goes to, to Athens. In Athens, not much happened. Paul preached a great sermon. Um, not many people believed. A few did. And so he goes down to Corinth. Now, in Corinth, there was a synagogue. Corinth was a huge city full of a lot of people, a lot of crazy activity, a lot of trade, a lot of sin. And Paul goes into the synagogue to preach to the Jews there, but then finally they said, you can't come here anymore. So Paul decides, well, if, if you guys don't want to hear the gospel, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And so they, they started a church in Justice's house. Now, it was strategically located. Justice's house was attached to the synagogue, right? It was it, hard, fast to the synagogue. It was right next door, sharing a wall. And so he starts the church there, but something was happening in Paul's heart. You see, as he's been going from place to place, and he's going from church to church and synagogue to synagogue, he realizes that this is the point in the story when they attack, when they accuse, when they grab him, and they persecute him. This is when he gets beat up. This is when he gets bludgeoned. This is when he goes to jail. This is the period. And and because of the history that Paul had had, fear was beginning to grip his heart. Now we know that because Jesus said in verse 9, the Lord spoke to Paul by a night vision, do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Notice this, verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. You see, this was the point when the attack would come. This is the point where, where Paul was beginning to think, I, maybe I should just shut up. Maybe I should just leave instead of having to flee in the middle of the night. Maybe I should stay silent. Yet Jesus comes to him and he says, hey, no, speak. Don't be afraid. And then he says, nobody is going to hurt you. Nobody's going to hurt you. I have many people in this city. Now, <clears throat> Paul knew, and this is what was causing the fear, he knew that at any moment, somebody could burst through the door and arrest him. At any moment, somebody could grab him out of the market and arrest him. At any moment, he could be attacked and beaten. And yet, he had this promise from Jesus, but it was, was it the promise that was keeping him from being afraid? No. There's much more to it than that. Fear is much more than believing the promises. Now, I know that we we like the promises of God, and yet, how many verses do you have memorized that tell you not to be anxious, to tell you not to fear, and yet you're still afraid, right? You're still fearful, and you know all of it. You have them memorized, and you're still fearful. And maybe you don't think, oh, well, maybe this doesn't apply to me in this circumstances. I don't know what you think about it. But there's a reality to it. The, the, the reality is that we are anxious, we are fearful, because it is, is what humans do when trouble comes. So what takes away the anxiety? The anxiety leaves when Jesus is near. When Jesus is proximate to us. He is there with us. He is touching us. His presence is manifest to us. Maybe not (coughs) necessarily in a vision like Paul. But Jesus is close and our, our thoughts, our hopes, our intentions are all fixed on him. This is what it says in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Here Jesus visits Paul. 
something is happening um, in his heart that is unexplainable, a peace that passes understanding. And we know that because he stayed there for a year and a half without fear, without fear uh, you know, of reprisal, without um, worrying about what's going to happen. Now, <clears throat> Jesus visits Paul. And that's kind of significant. Because right now, around the world, especially in the Middle East, we're, we're seeing a lot of this. We're seeing a lot of people, and my wife and I have been reading lots of books where this is happening, where Jesus is appearing to people. And he shows up, and there's two things that people say um, when Jesus appears to them. The first thing that's, that's universal, doesn't matter if it's a believer or non-believer, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, it doesn't matter. They all say the same thing. I couldn't believe the immense love that I felt from his presence. When, when I had the dream, when I had the vision, the, his love for me, even though he didn't say anything sometimes, was just overwhelming that they were loved by him. And, and, and you know, this is beautiful. But for the believers, those who would put their trust in him, they, they also added to that a peace that I could not explain came over me. And that peace was sustained in them. It wasn't just something that was there for the moment while he was there, but it was something that would provoke them to be bold in their faith, to move forward with, with courage and strength, and not to be afraid. They were fearless. Think about it. This, Paul could have left because of fear. He could have left prematurely, as he did in Thessalonica, as he did in Berea. He could have bailed out before things got tough, and yet he stuck it out because he had this promise of Jesus and he had an assurance of peace in his heart. And yet he would missed out on all the fellowship, all the discipleship, all the things that God would do there. Now, I can understand why Paul would think, you know, Corinth, this isn't the place I want to stay. This place is kind of a dead end. It, it was... Sin City, right? Corinth was the center of everything bad. A lot of wealth, a lot of money, but a lot of, in a lot of ways, you know, we think Sin City, we think Las Vegas, but let's up the ante a little bit and think more like Amsterdam, where human trafficking is legal, where all drugs are legal. I mean, it's just, it's a disgusting place and everything goes. And that's kind of what um, <clears throat> Corinth was, a lot of money, and a lot of sin, and Paul was probably thinking, this place isn't right for the gospel. This, this is mo the most wicked city in all of the Roman Empire. It, this is not a good place to spread the love of Jesus. And I think that we think that way sometimes, don't we? We think, you know, that place is too wicked, they're not going to want to hear about Jesus. Oh, this little suburban neighborhood, they want to hear about Jesus, but those awful people over there, they don't. Do, do you, you classify your friends this way, don't you? These guys are really close. They're so close. You know, just a little bit more prayer, and they're going to accept Jesus. These guys, ah, uh, they could go either way. I don't know. Um, they're kind of open to talking about it, but, you know, kind of close. No way. No way. These guys over here, they're atheists. They hate God. They use God's name in blasphemy. The, no way they're ever going to get <coughs> They're not going to get saved. <clears throat> I know in my life, my personal life, there was three people that I said, you know, to, probably to myself, I don't know, maybe I repeated it to others, but there's three people that I said, there's no way that person's ever going to get saved. The first one was my wife. We went on a date, and she bore her testimony to me. She wasn't a Christian, but she, went, she was going to church, to a church, and she bore her testimony to me and told me how wonderful her church was and how beautiful it was and everything. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, this girl's lost. There's no, she's brainwashed. There's no getting to her. You know, that's just, that was my first thought. Lord saved her, right? The second was my stepdad, Jeff Balaji. Now, many of you know him, and you know how radically on fire for Jesus he is. But <clears throat> I, I honestly thought that guy could never get saved. He hated God. He hated Jesus. I mean, he would vocalize it. He got mad if he saw you reading your Bible. No way. The third was my friend Gordon. And he was my best friend in, in high school, decided that he was going to be an atheist, very smart, very intellectual, um, read all the stuff, you know, anti-Christian, um, the books that atheists write, you know, hating on Christians. I don't know why they don't hate on other religions. It's always, they always attack Christianity. Have you noticed that? Just, I guess we're the only ones that are worth attacking. But <clears throat> he, he read that stuff, and he always would argue with me, and, and it got heated sometimes, and I thought, there's no way... Gordon is so, he's so set in his ways, he's brilliant, but he's so set in his ways that there's no way he's ever going to get saved. 
Well, a, as many of you know, I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I, I got to have lunch with him. He told me he was going to church. Blew my mind. I went to lunch with him last week, and all we did the entire time was talk about Jesus. I was just like, that's awesome. Just never, I mean, it's so surreal. You're sitting across from somebody, this guy will never get saved, and here he is talking about how the Lord's working in his life. It's, it never ceases to amaze me. So I am done saying that somebody is beyond the reach of the gospel. And Jesus would tell Paul, hey, Paul, I know you think that there's nobody here that would receive the, the word, but I have many people in this city. Paul, I have a lot of people here. Do you realize that even in Las Vegas, there is a large Christian community that minister to people? It's, it's amazing. God has his people everywhere, and he encourages Paul. So Paul stays in this wicked city for a year and a half. Shannon and I are reading um, Captive in Iran about two women who went to Evan prison. It's the same prison that Saeed was imprisoned at at first. Um, their, their names are Marzia and Miriam. <clears throat> they were arrested for being Christians, thrown into this prison, into the women's part of the prison. And what's amazing to me is as I read their story, they're just open to share the gospel with people in the prison, even though they're arrested for doing that. They, they're talking to people in the prison about the gospel. And the people that are receptive to it, I was, it, it just was blowing my mind. It, it was the murderers. It was the drug, you know, people who were rela- arrested on drug charges. People who were arrested as conspirators against the government, lesbians, hardcore women, all the, the women that beat each other up, these are the women's, women who were receptive and open to the gospel. Now why? why? Why them? Guys, what we have is good news. You realize that? It doesn't matter what you've done. It's, no, it doesn't matter where you've been. Jesus Christ came into this world, God in the flesh, to die for sins, everything you've ever done. And he came while you were still a sinner, died for your sins, and when you put your trust in him, when you believe on him, he makes you the righteousness of God in him. That's what the Bible says. We exchange this crummy life that we have wrecked and ruined, all the stuff that we have done that is is bad, for his abundant life, right? Right? We, we exchange all of our plans that are, are leading us nowhere for his awesome plan, for his abundant life. Now, wouldn't you agree that what God has for you is probably better than what you have for yourself? I mean, and I know you've tried it. Everybody, to some degree, has tried for something, right? And you thought to yourself, if I just had that house, if I just had that job, if I just had that sex, if I just had those drugs, if I just had something that would fulfill this hole inside, then I would be happy, then I'd be satisfied. How'd that go for you? It didn't work, did it? You found out that whatever you had, whatever you got that you thought was going to fulfill you, it may have been an idol for a little while, but if you thought it could fulfill you, you were deadly wrong, weren't you? It it can't. Ultimately, it's going to disappoint. And actually, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get what you want. Isn't that the sad thing about life? When you get what you want, it ends up being ashes in your mouth. It ends up being soap bubbles. That's why Solomon would say, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. We thought it was going to satisfy, and it didn't. And yet, when we come to Jesus, he satisfies, doesn't he? He satisfies our soul. He he gives us purpose. He gives us meaning. And actually, you know, it's a lesson that we learn as we walk with the Lord that we can't enjoy anything except through Him, right? I can't enjoy my kids except through Jesus. I can't enjoy my marriage except through Jesus. I can't enjoy my job except through Jesus. I can't enjoy my possessions except through Jesus. And yet when when God gives me blessings, it, it is fulfilling instead of empty. But then when I go through trials... Like Paul, he can give me grace in those trials, peace that passes understanding, joy in the midst of suffering. And that's what the Christian life is all about, is, is receiving grace, receiving, that word grace just means gift, receiving blessings from God that help me to get through each thing that I'm facing. Because the reality is, is that people want something real, right? They don't want religion. They don't want, okay, here's a bunch of rules you need to follow. Is that good news? It's not. It's bad news. 
In, in fact, when we think that we can establish our own righteousness by following rules, we, it actually, the Bible actually tells us we're far from God. And yet when we look to Him completely for our righteousness and our satisfaction and our fulfillment, He satisfies us. Paul is experiencing that there in Corinth for a year and a half, just freedom to know God has people in this city, to know <coughs> I'm not going to be harmed, to know that I don't have to be afraid to speak. Verse 12, it says, When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So, a year and a half, Paul has no problem, and then all of a sudden, they come and they grab him. And I, I guarantee you, this is what Paul was doing when they grabbed him. Okay, Jesus, you remember, you promised me, nobody's going to hurt me. Don't we, remind, <coughs> don't we remind God of his promises sometimes? <coughs> okay, God, you said your child isn't going to beg bread, and I'm down to my last slice. Eat that slice, and then I'll provide. <laughs> you know, that's the way he is oftentimes. So Paul's there <coughs> reminding him, but also probably remembering another promise that he had be brought before Gentiles and before the Jews and before rulers and kings. It's the first opportunity Paul's <coughs> had to be before a governor. Pretty big deal. Paul probably praying wondering what is going to come of this. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to say? He's probably not getting anything. He's like, okay, Lord, I'm just going to start speaking, and you're going to have to put the words in my mouth. I've been in that place before. I don't know about you. But I'm standing before somebody who really needs my help, and I'm, I'm coming up with nothing. And I, I believe God's word when he says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men liberally. And, and there's been times when I had nothing to say, and I just start to speak, and that's when God gives the word, when I start to speak like stepping into the river and then he parts the waters. You know, it happens sometimes. So Paul starts to speak. Notice this, verse 4. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if this were a matter <clears throat> of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be a reason I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be a judge over such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Now, we know from secular history <clears throat> that this um, Lucius Junius Gallo, Gallio um, Anonesis was the governor of Corinth between 51 and 52 AD. So that actually dates the por this portion of the book of Acts very accurately. We know within you know, a couple years, 51 to 52 is when Paul was in Corinth. And, and that's pretty neat because it kind of sets everything um, with, with a date for us. But he says, I don't want to judge over your religious rules, your, your own laws. I don't want to judge. If, if it, you've brought in for some wrongdoing or some crime, I'll hear your case, but I'm not going to try to sort this out for you. I'm not the religious police. It reminds me of when my wife got saved. When she was 17 and naive and went through a period of about eight months, <clears throat> eight to nine months, you know, to be born again, to finally get it, to finally bow her knees and accept Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And she was so excited, as you are, when you're saved, first saved. Remember when you first got saved and just how excited you were about Jesus? <clears throat> she went home and she was just so sure that her family was just going to want to hear this. And so she, you know, came in the door. You know, she just got done praying. She came in the door and she says, Mom, Dad, I found the truth. It's not your church. <laughs> and they were like, oh, we're so glad. So we, we've been looking for the truth. No, they weren't like that at all. They were like, what? You're apostate. You know, and that was their thought. And, and so this was very difficult, understandably very difficult for her parents. And um, her mom, you know, was, was really upset, you know, as moms can be. And... <clears throat> What happened was um, she was at work one day, and she was kind of venting to a lady that worked with her, a lady who wasn't a Christian or her religion. She just was there to talk to, and she was like, my daughter's 
left my church and she's gone to this other church and that weird Calvary Chapel and who knows what they do up there and, you know, and reading her Bible all the time and, you know, all this is just ranting, you know, as, as, as you can when you're upset. And the lady listened to her rant for a while and she said, let me, let me just, let me just process this with you. Let me just get this straight. So your daughter is not pregnant out of marriage. She's not doing drugs. She's not sleeping around. She hasn't run away. She's not living on the street. She, in, is, but she, she loves God, and she always wants to read her Bible and hang out with Christian people. And this is, this is bad how? Because I could tell you, <laughs> you know, my daughter, my kids, you know, and her mom just, she kind of had a, a light went on. She's like, oh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess I should thank my lucky stars. And that's when things turned around, you know, in our relationship. But it's amazing. You know, Gallio, maybe he understood that, you know, this isn't causing a problem to society. In fact, do you realize that Christianity actually enhances every culture? When, when authentic Jesus, when authentic Christianity enters into a place, it changes things for the good. People become better citizens. People become better families, right? When they put their trust in Jesus. And we see, we're, we're reaping, actually in our culture, we are reaping the benefits of that. Now, I don't know how long we can reap the benefits of that. Because our, our nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And we've experienced, by God's blessing, even the, the latest one probably in the 70s, revivals that have swept through our nation where people were turning to Jesus in record numbers and, and houses and lives were being changed and turned into a different, different direction. And you think of places, you know, Europe has experienced many revivals and not many too long ago. And Canada, and you think down to um, Australia and these places that were all kind of based on that Judeo-Christian ethic versus places that have not been. And you think back to the 80s, to communist Russia. When you think back to <clears throat> um, Nazi Germany where Christianity was kind of pushed out, what we're seeing happen in our culture, by the way, where Christianity was pushed out and the youth were brought up under this awful, wicked thing that creeps in somehow when nobody really believes it, but it, it creeps in anyway. It's called atheism. It's called evolution. They started teaching that to their kids. They started teaching that some humans were better than other humans, that, that um, those people aren't worthy of life because they're not as good. And they raised up a society of people who were willing to completely commit homicide against an entire, genocide against an entire race of people. It's sick. This is the ideology of communism. This is the ideology of, of North Korea and their dictatorship. No God that the state is supreme. And everywhere that happens, human rights go away. Liberties are taken. And it's no different from other ideologies such as um, Islam where, where Sharia law is, has taken hold. People lose their, their rights. They lose their, you know, I mean, women are oppressed. People are oppressed. Liberties are taken away. We live, we live in the benefits of great liberty, don't we? Because of God's word, because the gospel has come here. And at wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is, there is freedom, there is liberty. And we, we've experienced that in our nation. And that's what happens when Christianity comes to a place. And so Paul is bringing Christianity. You know, during the, the Welsh revivals, they had to close down all the, all the pubs, all the bars got closed. Not because people were rioting and prohibition. They closed because they had no patrons. Everybody was in the churches. Everybody was saved. And all the pubs closed. Isn't that beautiful? And that's what needs to happen in our nation. But that's what Christianity brings. That's what revival brings. And so they're not in any threat that, that, that crimes are going to be committed because people are becoming Christians. Unless loving Jesus is a crime. But any nation that would harm people or imprison people for that is, is basically writing their own death sentence. Notice the protection of God. It says, verse 17, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. Paul must be standing there watching this, thinking, 
well, this is different. <laughs> you know, usually I'm the one sitting, you know, at the thing getting beaten. Wow, Jesus really came through for me. It's, it, you know, and he, I'm sure he felt just great gratitude towards the Lord. And Sosthenes um, takes the beating. He probably wasn't expecting that. Now, Sosthenes is the new ruler of the synagogue because remember, Crispus, the former ruler of the synagogue, got saved and went next door to Justice's house to church instead of to synagogue. Now Sosthenes is getting, be- getting beaten. I'm sure Crispus was standing there thinking, Whew, glad that's not me. But what's beautiful about it, and perhaps through this circumstance, Sosthenes also gets saved. And we know that because Paul writes his first epistle back to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Sosthenes, our brother. Sosthenes wrote the book of 1 Corinthians with Paul. Isn't that awesome? So this guy gets saved too. This poor synagogue keeps losing their leaders to Christianity. It's awesome. Verse 18, So Paul, still remaining a good while, then took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had, <clears throat> he had his hair cut off in Centria. I have a hard time with that one. For he had taken a vow. So Paul is leaving to go home, and he decides to take a vow. <clears throat> now, Paul, remember, his heritage, his culture is Jewish, and so he's very much there, you know. And, and here he, he takes this probably, because he's having his hair cut, he's probably taking a Nazarite vow. And what, <coughs> what a Nazarite was, <coughs> was somebody who, <coughs> pardon me, somebody who dedicated themselves to God for a certain period of time, and during that period of time, as part of the vow, they would let no razor cut their hair, they would not eat anything from the vine, no wine, um, no grapes, they would abstain from that, and they wouldn't touch anything that was dead. That was kind of the part of the vow, and, and the whole idea was is just taking a time to seek God and to be separated to God. Now, uh, we do similar things, you know, maybe if you fast or something like that, you, you're fasting, seeking the Lord, and people do those things for different reasons, right? They, they take vows, maybe they give an offering, they do something for, for different reasons, but what we can kind of surmise is that Paul is probably doing this out of gratitude. Jesus protected him in Corinth. It was a, it was a close brush with persecution, but he didn't experience any of it, and Jesus told him he wouldn't, and so he, it seems, takes this vow just to be grateful to God. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. And yet I would, I would submit to you that that is how our Christianity should be lived out. In gratitude to Jesus. Everything that we do as Christians should be out of gratefulness for what he has done for us. And I think that sometimes that's lacking. I think sometimes we don't think about that. But, but just, just for a moment, just picture yourself on the way to hell. You are, you are heading towards the flames and Jesus snatched you out of that and set your feet on solid ground and saved you. Now think about the gratitude that we should have for what he has done in just that. And, and, and then the other blessings that he brings into our lives on top of that. It, it's mind-blowing. Because I think a lot of times what we do as Christians is we, <clears throat> we live out of, instead of gratitude, we live out of guilt or obligation or rules, or whatever. Think, think about just for the motives that people give money, give money to the church. A lot of people give money to the church because they feel guilty, or because they're compelled to go, somebody puts pressure on them, <clears throat> or, or whatever, there could be a multitude of reasons, or maybe because they're trying to g- gain favor from God somehow by giving money. And yet, the only reason we should give money to God Remember, Paul tells the Corinthians, hey, God loves a cheerful giver, not a begrudged giver, not a a compelled giver, but he loves somebody who gives out of gratitude. Jesus, I know you've done it all for me, but I just want to be a part of what you're doing. I want to give this offering to you by faith. I want to serve these kids in children's ministry by faith because you love me and because you died for me. I want to do this for you. I want to whatever it is that we do, and I think that that should permeate a Christian's life all the way through. 
that what we do for Jesus is out of gratitude for him. You know, when, when I'm mowing somebody's lawn or something, or doing something for somebody, I'm not mowing their lawn, I'm mowing Jesus' lawn. Jesus did, did all that for me, and Jesus, I'm so grateful that I can mow this lawn because you, you did all that for me. You know, to have that attitude of service, of gratitude as a Christian. And so Paul, he, he does this out of gratitude, it would seem. <clears throat> and, and basically the vow would go that he would shave his hair or cut his hair so, because he's not going to let it, he's going to let it grow out this whole time, three, three months, six months, a year maybe, um, depending on how long his vow is. And he would set it at an appointed time when the vow would be over. He'd cut his hair, offer his hair at the temple along with two lambs, a boy and a girl, lamb, a ram, a, bre- a grain offering, a drink offering. <coughs> and you bring all, the <coughs> excuse me, bring all this to the temple and his vow would be ended. And so that's what Paul was doing. Now, he's not trying to set a precedent that we should take vows. Remember, um, Col- Colossians says, don't let anybody judge you on new moons, on Sabbath days, and what you're going to eat. You know, all those things are shadows of the substance which is Christ, right? That's what Colossians chapter 2 tells us, that, we, that Jesus is the substance. And yet, with Jesus in mind, and realizing Jesus is the fulfillment of these things, he does this. And it seemed that that was okay in the early church for the Jewish Christians to um, continue to practice some of these things in terms of their relationship with Jesus, but not out of, not out of um, religious duty. Verse 19, it says, He came to Ephesus and left them there, that's Priscilla and Aquila, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So Paul, they, they stop in Ephesus, they go across to Ephesus, they haven't, they're on their way to Syria, they haven't gotten there yet. And he stops in Ephesus, which happens to be in Asia. Remember, the Holy Spirit forbid them to go to Asia. And now he's in Asia. So obviously, the Holy Spirit speaking to him before saying, don't go to Asia, is now telling him it wasn't a no, it was a wait. Wait. We don't always like that, do we? Wait. That's like a four-letter word to a Christian, right? <laughs> wait. No, I don't want to wait. I want it now. Maybe it's just two Americans. We, <laughs> we, want it. we want it our way. We want it now, right? And yet, there's something about waiting that God does within us. <clears throat> God has this perfect timing, doesn't he? And sometimes we want something. Sometimes we're eager for something. Sometimes we've been waiting a long time for something, and we want it now. And yet, Jesus is telling us, be patient. Wait. Wait. Just wait on me. You know, my wife and I, um, and I've told this story before, but I just want to just briefly share it just for a, a specific reason. And that is, <clears throat> when, we, when we first got married, we wanted children. We tried to have children for seven years. No good. And so finally, we went to a pastor's and wives retreat, and the Lord gave us a prophecy at that retreat. A lady came up to Shannon and said, you know, the Lord... Um, is going to give you children, they're going to be a light to your family, which was huge to her. I mean, that was just like, she started crying. I came up. She says, tell them. She told me. I said, I prayed for this. And Shannon said, I did too. We both prayed for different reasons. We both prayed that the Lord at that retreat would show us if we could have children. So we, at, at that moment, we knew absolutely that the Lord was going to do it. Nothing could, could hinder that. I mean, people were saying, oh, maybe this or maybe that or maybe you should do in vitro. We knew, No. We know God's going to give us a child. And we went a year with that faith. We knew it. And we were in perfect peace about it that entire year. And yet a year goes by. And at at that time, at the end of that year, we're kind of beginning to ask, well, we know we're going to have a child, but when? We know that, you know, God said soon, but what's soon to God? I mean, a year's like a thousand days, a thousand days like a year. I mean, uh uh-oh. You know I mean? How soon is soon, God? And so we started to pray that. And she went to another retreat, a a pastor's wife's retreat in California, and these two ladies she didn't even know prophesied over her, and one lady said, the Lord knows you've been waiting a year. She didn't know, Shannon. The Lord knows you've been waiting a year. You're going to have a child very soon. The other lady says, he's healing your womb as we speak. And then the the, the first lady, Olga, (coughs) said, I saw a boy, and his name was Isaiah. And 
she gave her a verse. Now, what was interesting is Shannon forgot that the lady said his name was Isaiah. I think the Lord made her forget. But she gave a verse, Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will walk and not grow weary. They will run and not grow faint. What a promise. And, and yet that's exactly what happened. Of course, a, a, a month later on the day, you know, that was October 5th. She got the prophecy. November 5th, we conceived. Had Isaiah nine months later. But because we were, we were patient to wait on the Lord in that time, we were receiving the grace, that peace during that period. Because we were, we were waiting, when the, the promise came and was fulfilled, it gave us the strength to wait for the next one, to wait for the next thing, to wait for whatever the Lord might bring to us. You see, waiting is, is important to you as a Christian because it helps you to see that God is faithful and, and that you can get through the trials, that they don't last forever, and that He can sustain you through them. It's so important to understand that. God, His timing is perfect, and all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called, <coughs> those who are the called according to His purpose. You may be waiting for something right now, and I know that many of you are. You're waiting for something. And it's agonizing. You don't know what the outcome's going to be. And yet God, through the midst of that waiting, can renew your strength if you will seek Him for that peace. Verse 20, it says, When they asked Him to stay longer, <clears throat> a longer time with them, He did not consent. He's probably thinking, Oh man, I wish I wouldn't have taken this vow. He didn't consent, but took leave, saying, I must, by all means, keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. That was when his vow was going to end. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he, and he sailed from Ephesus. It's interesting. He encounters another synagogue that's open to the gospel and isn't enraged when he tells them that Jesus is the Messiah. They're like, we want to hear more. Come back again. He's like, oh, I can't. Darn. I mean, how often does that happen? Usually he's thrown out. You know, you can't come back here. <clears throat> this time they're like, hey, come back again, come back again. Oh, I wish I could, and he will. But this is the thing. He's going he's gonna to come back to Ephesus. He's going to make good on his promise. He's going to stay there for two years. But I want to draw you, your attention to a little phrase that Paul uses, and that is God willing. And that should be your life's chant. If God wills. James tells us in James chapter 4 <coughs> that if we're making plans <coughs> with no thought to God, being that our life is just a vapor, and we boast in our arrogance that I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, it's evil. But rather we should say, if the Lord wills, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. I, I'm not just going to do my thing. Now many of you and most of us have tried all that. And it hasn't worked out too well for us. And so what we do is we say, God, if, you're, if it's your will, but lead me. We, we are on a path. We're on a different path than the world is. Last night when we were praying for service, Chuck Carr was praying. He said, Lord, help us to be tuned to your frequency and not the frequency of the world. And that's exactly right. To be tuned to heaven's frequency. To be taking orders from heaven and not from the, just the things that are happening in our life. Not from the world around us. But God, what is your will? What do you want me to do in this circumstance? You see, every Christian should be a little bit out of place in this world. You know, Jesus isn't an American. He's, he's not a Canadian. Praise God. Otherwise, we'd have to say, hey, eh, you up there, eh? You know, it wouldn't be good, would it? He's not a German. He's not a Russian. He's not a Chinese. He's God over all. None of us are, are, are privileged to be God's special people like the Jews were. But everyone is, is equal at the cross of Jesus Christ. And we come to him, we're forgiven. We come to him, we are the righteousness of God in him. But we should be a little bit, because of that, we should be a little bit out of place here in, in this world. I don't care what country you're in, you're going to be a little bit out, kind of like a, a country boy hanging out in the city. Right? He doesn't quite know the rule. He's kind of <clears throat> staggering with his cowboy boots through the city, his cowboy hat on, and everybody's in business suits. He's out of place. He's dressed different. His talk is a little bit different. 
or so to a city boy in the country. Pulls up in his fancy car and gets out, and he's just like worried about getting dirty. And that's what we do out here is get dirty, right? A little bit out of place. Like, like the Amish man who went to New York City, and he, he saw this huge skyscraper, and him and his son walked into this immaculate, opulent foyer. And there was these two silver doors on the end. He'd never seen anything like it before in his life. And he saw this little old lady, and she kind of hobbled over to the door. She wa- the doors opened. She walked in. The doors closed. Some lights flashed. The doors opened again, and a beautiful, tall woman walked out. And the boy and, and, the, and the father were just, they were amazed. And the man looks at his son, he says, go get your mama. <laughs> that's, that's your Mother's Day joke today. <clears throat> but we should be a little bit out of place. Tuned to a different frequency, walking by a different beat, because our home is in heaven and not on this earth. His will is, is our will. Not my will be done, but your will be done, God. That should be our, our plea, our cry. Verse 22, it says, When he had landed in Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. That makes no sense. Okay, okay, I'm just going to explain this, because this is a cultural difference here that's completely beyond us. Now, notice what he did. He landed at Caesarea. This is north uh, of Israel, just slightly north, northern part of Israel, kind of up above a uh, port city, and he goes south to Jerusalem. That's what it means by he went, uh, he, when he had gone up and greeted the church. He, he went south to Jerusalem up, because it's on Mount Zion, and everything from Jerusalem is down, right? You only can go up to Jerusalem. So he goes up to Jerusalem, south, <clears throat> and he greeted the church, fulfilled his vow, apparently. And then he went down, way north, 150 miles north or so, to Antioch. That's when he went down to Antioch. Okay, <laughs> So it's like... <clears throat> <clears throat> After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the regions of Galatia, Phrygia, <coughs> in order... Strengthen the disciples. So he ends his third mission, er, second missionary journey and begins his third missionary journey. And that's, that's kind of the end of that first one, and, and we'll get into the second missionary journey as he travels to Ephesus in chapter 19. But a, a few things I just want to kind of, I just want to tie everything together for you that we've looked at today. The first is, is God's will in our life. If we're following God's will, and we're asking God, do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do that? Will you lead me? I want to do this, God willing. This is, this is what I have planned, but if, if you want to change it, God, you're welcome to. You know, it's kind of living that life of, of obedience and, and talking to him, God, your will be done in my life. And as we're moving forward, as God's will is done in our life, then God begins to be more apparent to us. This is what we notice. We notice as he's leading us that he does things that lead us. He provides miracles. He provides for us when we're in need. He, he sh- takes us through things. And when we're, when we're in proximity to God, when His presence is manifest to us, then He gives us peace. He will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Him because He trusts in Him, right? So when my, my mind is fixed on Jesus, His will for my life, and so He begins to give me peace in my life. And when I have God's peace, no matter what trial I go through or no matter what blessing I go through, I'm not in the blessing thinking, when's the next shoe going to fall? Things have been going really good. Things bad things are going to happen soon. And I'm not in the middle of the trial thinking, you know, I can't bear this. Because in either circumstance, God gives us the grace to go through it. And we can live a life that is absolutely fearless. To trust Jesus. To know that He's taking care of us and to lean on Him at every moment. And that is your inheritance as a Christian. And if you're not living that life, I encourage you to reach out and take hold of it because it belongs to you if you're a believer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for these things, and I know um, these things have been timely to so many. To know, Lord Jesus, that You are sufficient for us. to know that we, we can't come to you with our achievements or our, our, the rules we've kept or the things we've done, Lord, but we come to you only with our sin piled high 
and you take it from us and you cast it as far as the east is from the west. You put your righteousness on us. And we stand before God because of what you did and not because of what we're doing or we've done. And so we come to you, Jesus, humbled. We come to you, needy. <clears throat> Lord, asking your will for our lives, that you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would provide for us, that you would meet us in every circumstance to provide the grace that we need, the gift that we need at the moment. <clears throat> whether it be strength, whether it be boldness, whether it be peace, comfort, all these things are available <coughs> are, are available through you, Jesus. I just pray that we would not miss what you have for us because we've strayed to, to follow our own will. We've strayed to follow our own plans. Lord, help us to change that today and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done that we might follow you, that we might live victorious lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.